take a look at Nightbreed. Now, this is the second film that Barker ever directed. And it was um, it was largely thought at the time, certainly amongst um, the studios and whatnot, that Barker was going to be sort of the next horror luminary. That's kind of what they wanted to pigeonhole him as. Um, it's certainly what his publishers and whatnot wanted. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be what the man himself was interested in. Um, he wanted to explore a little bit further afield than that. He was interested in ambiguity and in the potential of strange, bizarre, disturbing material outside of any particular genre prescriptions or parameters. That meant that his next film project was massively troubled. An adaptation of his novella Cabal, um, Nightbreed was set to be a very, very different animal from Hellraiser, um, and that was a problem certainly for the studios and certainly for um, cinemas in general, because it, it, the book Cabal is very, 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 very far away from the Hellbound Heart in terms of its themes, its absurdity, its strange, it's just sheer strangeness, its moral ambiguity, if nothing else. I mean, it's closer to a very, very grim, horrific fantasy story. It's a kind of inverse mythic fable. Um, and adapting that for screen, particularly in the 1980s, was always going to be a problem, um, even if it were not for the interference of the studios and what and so on and so forth. And also Bar just Barker's sheer inexperience. I mean, you have to bear in mind, barring student projects like Salome and the Forbidden, Hellraiser was the very first project he ever directed. So he was kind of a, a little bit green around the gills in many respects. Um, it was a massively troubled shoot, a massively troubled shoot. Um, very often d the studios and the people basically with the money weren't really sure what Barker was doing. And he, from what I understand, he took pains to make sure that they didn't because the work is some, he intended the work to be something outside the bounds of prescribed cinema. He certainly didn't want to reproduce Hellraiser or anything like Hellraiser. And that was an enormous problem um, because, of course, Hellraiser was enormously successful. So the studios wanted another Hellraiser from him. What they wanted him to be was the next John Carpenter or the next Wes Craven. That's what they wanted from him. Um, but it isn't what he wanted to be, and it certainly wasn't what he wanted to express. The end product, um, depending on which version you see, uh, because it was butchered and ha That's my cat Rufus, by the way. Um, it was butchered and hacked to pieces um, during editing to make it something a little bit more simplistic, a little bit more palatable to standard cinema going audiences. Um, the result is a number of versions of the film that are kind of ambiguous. Some of them are more complex than others. Some of them are more straightforward. Some of them are more resonant of horror films. Some of them are more resonant of a sort of mythic fantasy or fable. Um, whichever version you see, it's an interesting piece of work. It's massively ambitious given the technological constraints of the era, um, given the budgets Barker was working under, um, it was enormously ambitious. It's a special effects and costume laden. There are monsters and creatures and demons and gods and demigods of all stripe and size and some which are absolutely stunning in terms of their design. He, he Barker clearly intended this to be a kind of extravaganza. He wanted to hurl the audience into a sort of Boschian nightmare where there are distortions of humanity and creatures and monsters everywhere. And that's kind of what you get. But one of the big problems with the film is there's not enough of it. There's not enough of it. You don't get the same degree of monstrosity that you get in the book, of course, or the same elaboration of monstrosity, because, of course, in the book, there are no constraints. He Barker can construct any, any surreal and strange entity that he wants, because, of course, it's you who imagines it. It's you who fills it in. Um, 
hang on one moment, she wants to go out. Hey, Rufus. Whereas in the film, of course, Barker is operating under the constraints of technology of the era. I mean, this is well, well, well before the advent of CG, certainly to any meaningful degree. Um, all of the effects and costumes are practical. Um, and I think the film actually benefits from that enormously. I mean, I'm not a purist. I don't think that CG has no place or anything to that effect. I think it can work beautifully. Um, but I'm not convinced that this film would be any better as with the inclusion of CG creatures or monsters. It works very well in films like The Lord of the Rings, for example, where there is already a separation from physical reality, where you're operating in a kind of heightened state anyway. So you can forgive certain things. You can forgive perhaps the crudity of the effects or the fact that, that they are clearly not there. Um, but I do have a penchant for practical effects. As a lot of horror fans and cinema fans do, I like the notion that there is something physical there, um, whether it's a puppet or a guy in latex makeup or whatever. It doesn't really bother me. But it, physical effects tend to have a weight at the moment and a detail and a, a legitimacy that CG effects just don't. They just don't. The I can count on the fingers of one hand the creatures, the CG monsters that work, or creatures that work for me. And the vast majority of them are from the Lord of the Rings series or from The Hobbit. Um, certainly in something that has that's closer to reality, CG just doesn't work. It tends to be too flimsy. It tends to be too light and weightless. It tends to not have the right interactions with the physical world around it and I don't like that I find that, that rips me out of the fantasy that reminds me that I'm watching a film um, I much prefer a puppet I much prefer a a well done physical practical effect or a costume to be perfectly honest and if it's shot well then you can you can create something that has as much that has just beautiful verisimilitude that feels real. I mean, the, the best example I can think of is Ridley Scott's Alien, the original Alien, I mean, which is just a guy in a costume. The original Xenomorph is just a chap, a very skinny chap in a latex costume, slathered in KY jelly. Um, it works because of the way Ridley Scott shoots it, um, where you don't see the full creature, at least right until the end. You only see bits and parts of it. So you're left uncertain as to what the creature actually looks like and your imagination then fills in the blanks and creates something far more alien and monstrous than what the actual alien actually looks like um the physical effects in nightbreed are fantastic they're all really really good um the costumes are glorious and just bizarrely designed they it is like watching um one of barker's more surreal novels come to life on screen there it's like his paintings a lot of the creatures really do resemble the paintings that he's done in the years since um and there's an entire menagerie of them they're all very very beautiful very interesting um the film is choppy and arrhythmic and weird it doesn't really know where it's going and that's largely due to the editing it's largely due to a, a number of other, other factors as well that were upon that were influencing upon it. I mean, this was going to be a mainstream commercial release, so it had to conform to particular parameters, and as a result, a lot of it hit the cutting room floor. Although it has been recently restored to something closer to its original intention, um, and by all accounts, the new cut is fantastic. So this may bear a re-review at some point, because the by all accounts, the new cut is much closer to the novel and much closer to what Barker originally envisioned. But what do you get for that? Uh, taking all that into consideration, what do you get? What you get is a peculiar and curious film. It's like almost everything Barker touches. It's imperfect, but massively, massively powerful. It exercises this very strange, delirious slightly hallucinogenic quality it makes you feel like you're not quite anchored in reality anymore the the world in which it operates is slightly removed from reality um slightly comic book in many respects much more more so than hellraiser hellraiser is weighty and deep and dark and serious whereas 
Nightbreed has more of a sense of humour about itself, is slightly more wry, and is also just more surreal. It's stranger and more fantastical than Hellraiser is. Um, and a very, very different film in terms of tone and rhythm as well. It is not what one would expect Barker to have created, quite frankly, after Hellraiser. It just isn't. You would not have expected him to create a film like it. But it is fun to watch. It's interesting. The characters are generally well written. There's some very hokey dialogue in it. Um, one of the oddest, oddest casting decisions in history is the psych the um, psychiatrist Decker, who is played by David Cronenberg. It's one of the oddest bits of casting ever, but it actually really works because Cronenberg is not an actor. That much is very clear. He's not an actor, but he plays it with this cold lack of emotion, this this total restraint where he doesn't he seems more inhuman than the various latex creatures and monsters running around he seems far more inhuman and that fits perfectly that works really well he's actually one of the most interesting parts of the film and um it does work it works beautifully um it doesn't it the film kind of lacks direction so it builds to a crescendo that perhaps there wasn't the time or the budget to film properly and as a result it's not quite it doesn't feel quite finished it doesn't feel quite together and that actually in a bizarre way doesn't hurt it it's an odd thing but it's it's lack of perfection it's lack of polish actually lends it a certain curiosity it feels more like an independent film than a, a something that had mainstream studio support or a budget behind it. And it's lots of fun. It's actually a film that is a hell of a lot of fun to sit down and watch. Um, it's more eminently watchable than, say, Hellraiser, which is weightier and more disturbing and more distressing and that requires a bit more sort of intellectual engagement. I think, given the time and the scope and resources to do what he actually wanted to do, to do Nightbreed could have been like that it could have had this real weight and resonance to it as it stands it does it has some interesting ideas i mean it plays with all the same ideas as the book does where you have the monsters of midian being the sympathetic parties and the forces of order and humanity and society being the the negative aspects you uh, being the the villains essentially and that is a really interesting tension and works very well but it's clearly one that the studios wanted to downplay. They wanted something a bit more straight down the line where the monsters are the monsters and the police are the police and the, the, the priest is the priest and the good guys are the good guys and the bad guys are the bad guys and that's it. It doesn't play out like that, but it, it the film is as a result at war with itself. There are all of these strains and tensions acting upon it that make it kind of tear apart towards the end. And it promises a franchise that never really transpired. Now, this is this is a very very common thing for Barker in wider media. You often get these unfinished ideas. Um, Nightbreed is one of them. Nightbreed was intended to be what Hellraiser, funnily enough, became. Um, Nightbreed was intended to spawn a franchise. It was intended to be like comic books and action figures and a series of novels and a series of films. And that's very clear. That's very, very clear. It just didn't happen because the film just did not do well enough unfortunately. Um, and also, it was the film that marked Barker's move away from the uh, from Hollywood cinema making. He, re he, he waxes quite eloquent on it in various interviews and in the book, his uh, biography, The Dark Fantastic, it really does. He talks about how much he hates the process and how anti-creative it actually is and how much the people running it have no idea of what they're doing he really loads it so that it marks that if nothing else it and Barker did not and does not direct another film for a good long time after this a good long time he's involved in others he's involved in a lot actually as a producer or funding particular projects but does not direct another film for a long time but what's interesting about Nightbreed and Cabal is the work that doesn't exist, funnily enough. That's one of the most interesting things about it. The fact that the Nightbreed, the book and the film, both set up potential franchises. There are definitely spaces to tell stories. 
in this mythology. And by all accounts, Barker did intend that. There were going to be sequels. Doubt there ever will be now. Um, unless someone remakes it, which is entirely possible. And it could, one of the, it's actually one of the very few films I can think of that could benefit from a remake, that would actually probably benefit from being remade rather than just being a simple rehash. Um, you could make something beautiful out of this material very, very easily with sufficient budget and freedom. You could make something beautiful. I'd actually like Cronenberg to do it. That would be really weird, having Cronenberg direct it after starring in the original. That would be really interesting, and it's the kind of material that would suit him really well. But it's the stuff that didn't transpire the wider mythology of the Nightbreed and of the, the god Baphomet that created them and of its message, the message that its blood carries out across humanity, um, the deviance that they carry out across humanity. I mean, there, I remember reading somewhere there was going to be eventually a meeting of the Nightbreed and the Cenobites. There was going to be this overarching mythology where the two were um, antipodean to one another. They were enemies. Uh, that could have been fantastic. I would have loved to have seen the Nightbreed and the the Cenobites at odds with one another. That could have been just a spectacular piece of work, um, but sadly never transpired and almost certainly never will at this point for reasons that will probably become clear. But that's Nightbreed. It's an odd thing. It's an odd thing. It's worth a look. It's definitely worth a look, but it's strange. It's peculiar. It's not perfect at all. And... Um, it's an oddity. It's a real, real oddity. Mm -hmm.